This is the sermon for August 20th, 2023, and uh, it's one of my favorite passages. It's a bit of a challenge, uh, this passage, and I'm grabbing a quick moment here to record between lawn mowing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I love to be outdoors for this, and it's such a beautiful setting, and you get to see it behind me. Normally, I'm looking at it when I'm working out here. But yeah, so I'm going to read from Matthew 15, 21 to 28. And it's the story of the Canaanite woman who was pagan and a foreigner. And Jesus and his disciples were Jewish men with all the expectations that they had. And so here's the passage. From there, Jesus took it a trip to Tyre and Sidon. They had hardly arrived when a Canaanite woman came down from the hills and pleaded, Mercy, Master, Son of David, my daughter is cruelly afflicted by an evil spirit. Jesus ignored her. The disciples came and complained, Now she's bothering us. Would you please take care of her? She's driving us crazy. Jesus refused, telling them, I've got my hands full dealing with the lost sheep of Israel. Then the woman came back to Jesus, dropped to her knees, and begged, Master, help me. He said, It's not right to take bread out of the children's mouths and throw it to dogs. She was quick. You're right, Master, but beggar dogs do get scraps from the Master's table. Jesus gave in. Oh, woman, your faith is something else. What you want is what you get. Right then, her daughter became well. So well, that's Matthew 15. It is a surprising passage. Most people skirt over anything that makes them uncomfortable in the passage. And Jesus telling a woman no. And uh, he's too busy with working with Jewish people. He can't help it. A Canaanite woman, a pagan foreigner woman. And so most people pass right over this passage. And even the thing he, he says to her, it's not right to take bread out of children's mouths, meaning the Jewish people, and throw it to dogs, meaning Gentile people. And she engages right in, and they call this a wisdom dialogue. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So before this passage that I just read, 21 to 28, in Matthew 15, Jesus is explaining to the disciples all about rules. And not just the disciples, but the Jewish people who are very interested in Jewish people following purity codes. Now purity codes is like before you eat, you pour water that's been sanctified over your hands, or you eat unclean. And this wasn't about germs, because they didn't know about germs back then. You know, this is ancient times in the Middle East. and uh, But it was a Jewish process that set them apart from people who ate in an unclean way. Meaning, not purity. And uh, there are purity codes today in the Christian faith. And I'll name some that are kind of past. Like, used to be Christians didn't play cards. That was kind of a purity code. And what's funny is they worked a workaround for that and they created uh, card games that didn't involve standard cards with kings and queens and jacks and aces. And so they created other things that could be Christian games. So, I mean, just to give you an idea what purity codes are like. But anyway, before the, today's passage, Jesus is explaining both patiently and not so patiently that using systems of rules to define reality to define what righteousness is, to define God's ways, to define the point of life with God. And Jesus says, no, that's not it. That is not it. It is not about purity codes and following rules. And the funny thing is about laws. Anytime you have laws or purity codes, people start to wiggle around the rules. And it reminded me, um, you don't even have to be a lawyer to want to wiggle around the rules. You just need the, the lawyer mindset or the mindset of a two-year-old or a teenager. Who wants to wiggle around the rules more than two-year-olds or teenagers 
or adults that don't get out of that stage or just regular adults. <laughs> so I remember when I was appointed to New Milford Church, a woman wore a sweatshirt that said, how bad can I be and still get into heaven? She wore that to the first meeting with the pastor. And of course we laughed about it. She wasn't somebody who attended church much, but she was willing to be on the committee, which is appreciated. And um, she was kind of a rebel. And so I've never forgotten that. Every kid asks, how bad can I be? And not get into really big trouble. So anyway, we have this story. First of all, Jesus is tussling with the authorities and he's trying to teach his disciples that life with God is not about following rules. And, and then we have this story of the Canaanite woman who breaks every rule just by who she is. And um, this story breaks apart every expectation that the Jewish people had about who's in and who's out. And so the lesson here is that when we think we have things figured out, this is how it is. This is God's rules. This is, is how you become a Christian. This is how you get saved. This, you know, you, you think you have it all figured out. And this story tells us, no, we don't have it figured out. <laughs> it's not about rules, but it seems to be baked into us to want to rebel. So what do we do with that? Let's work it for good. Let's figure out how God maybe gave us a gift in us wanting to be a, a rebel. So a Canaan, Canaanite woman was a foreigner who was dismissed or even hated by the good Jewish men in charge. So they thought, well, if Jesus wants to help her, great, but she's not going to bother us. <laughs> That's what they thought. And even Jesus says, no, I'm not going to help you. I came for the Jewish people. And she changes his mind. It's very much, you've got to think in terms of a black person coming up to good old boys in the South and asking for help. How, how successful do you think that would be? <laughs> that's, that's the position of this Canaanite woman when she talks with Jesus and then is there with the disciples. So, yeah, in India today, there's still a caste system that the lowest caste is most disliked and most dismissed by anyone above them in the caste system. And my father used to love to point out, since he came here from Dublin, he came to Chicago area from Dublin, and he loved to point out that before Irish people were accepted uh, as immigrants, there used to be signs in stores that said, no dogs and no Irish allowed. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Dogs and Irish were equated and they weren't allowed in the stores. All right. So knowing this about the Canaanite woman is important to understand why Jesus' disciples said that she was driving them crazy. She, they asked Jesus to send her away or take care of her. Just get rid of her. I mean, you know, or meet her need. You know, they didn't care. They just didn't want to be bothered. And she comes down from the hills and she says, Mercy, Master, Son of David. She even recognizes by saying Son of David that he's Jewish and she's not. But she's asking for mercy. Who says no to someone begging for mercy for her child? There couldn't be anything more passionate about this. And uh, yeah, say whatever you like about the passage. But how could Jesus initially deny her help and speak disrespectfully to her? Well, maybe it was disrespectful. Maybe it was inviting her into a wisdom dialogue. We don't know. We just take our best guess. We just have what's given to us in the gospel. And so some scholars say that a wisdom dialogue is very much like a table tennis match, ping pong. You know, you play ping pong and what if the winner is a surprise? There's a back and forth. There's an engagement. I used to play ping pong with my family, even though I'm terrible at it and always was terrible. And I never won, you know. <laughs> but we could laugh and occasionally there'd be a good point, you know. And that's what this is like. Uh, Jesus says you don't take bread out of the children's mouth and give it to the dogs. 
and she comes back quickly. But even beggar dogs get to eat scraps that fall from the table. She's almost acknowledging the point Jesus is making. So they've engaged in this conversation. They've engaged in a relationship. And that's what I think being a Christian is about. Uh, no matter what kind of mistakes we make, we're in the business of giving mercy, but we're also in the business of engaging in relationship, engaging in conversation. There's a French word for this, repartee, which just means the back and forth. And um, she convinces Jesus that she has a stronger faith than some people in Israel. And again, that's kind of an affront. That's an insult to some of the Jewish people. How can a pagan foreigner have a stronger faith or a more appropriate faith or faith <laughs> compared to the Jewish people? So the passage in Matthew is surprising and strong. I wrote to a friend of mine that I think this passage could be a favorite of uppity women everywhere because she engages and changes Jesus's mind. Where does mercy belong? And where doesn't mercy belong? That question tugs at strong feelings in me. When have I deserved mercy? When have you deserved mercy? When did you not deserve mercy? When we're desperate and we're longing and we're asking. And like I said, we're desperate. That's what it comes right down to. And what we need is mercy and grace. What we need is a surprise. And the church is in the business of the surprise, right? <laughs> and that's what Jesus is about. You know, even his death, as horrible as it is, is about a surprise. It's about resurrection. It's about going through what the downcast, downtrodden, rejected people go through. And then God brings about the surprise. And I think that the surprise always comes in the relationship, in the give and take, in listening. And I learned last week that uh, a bird tries to fly with two wings. How well does a bird fly with one wing? So a friend of mine, and I don't know where she got this, but she likened to one wing being what is the reality, the harsh reality of life. And some people only look at the harsh reality of life and they're like a bird trying to fly with one wing. The other wing is love and compassion. And how can we live life with only love and compassion and without acknowledging reality or only acknowledging reality and not acknowledging love and compassion? Isn't that a beautiful image? Reality or the, the way things are, you'll hear people say, that's the way things are. And what they mean is tough luck, you know? What you get is, is what you deserve. What you deserve is what you get. Kind of that circular, that's reality. Uh, someone who says, I know how it is. And you know, our culture is big on I know what it is. That's that whole ego thing. I said, everyone is addicted to ego. Children need a solid sense of reality. They need the facts, the rules, the expectations. Of course they do. But they also need love and compassion. They need all that is given in validating um, the fact that they are loved. And so we don't talk at people. We talk with others. We're engaged. No matter what our entrenched views are, of reality. Could we listen to the other side? Could we be a part of surprising mercy? Could we be part of grace? Grace and mercy are never deserved. Not really. And yet they're given to us. Amen. Amen. <laughs>